John Milton's Paradise Lost is the greatest long poem in the English language. It's an epic of the Christian story, and yet not without controversy. Milton gives us God as a character, Satan as a character, unfallen Adam and Eve as characters, and he takes liberty with the biblical story, filling in gaps along the way. In this class, we'll look at some of those controversies, but in particular, we're gonna look at Satan as a character, what Milton's up to with that character. Is, is Satan the hero of the great poem? And what does this poem have to offer for us today in our own time? Why does Satan seem to run free and to suck up all the oxygen in the opening books of Paradise Lost? Has Milton made Satan his hero? Before we take up these questions, I want to say something about Milton's poetry. This is the greatest long poem in the English language, and Milton is, it goes without saying, a master poet ranked only second to Shakespeare. But few people read poetry today. Why should we? What does it offer us? Poetry is often visual through the imagination and always musical. It comes to us through the ear. It doesn't always sound good or euphonious. It might be cacophonous, but we should notice the sounds that we hear and take note of the images that the poet puts in our heads. For example, when Milton puts Satan's fall into poetry, here's what we get. Him, the almighty power, hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky, with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire. I find it hard to imagine a better way of saying this. These powerful words affect our emotions, they move us, they give us an experience of this event. In poetry, every line break, every punctuation mark, every word, even every sound is meaningful. When we read the masters, you can trust that everything is intentional. Let us affirm that the words of poetry aren't so many husks to be shucked. They are, as Terry Eagleton says in a different context, constitutive of the meaning. We should never shuck the words in favor of ideas. The words give us the experience of the ideas. Now let's consider how Milton depicts Satan speaking. Satan says this about his battle against God. All is not lost, the unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate, and what is else not to be overcome? That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his power, who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire. You can feel the power of Satan's rhetoric, but did you notice the ironies? How he speaks of God as the potent victor, unusual language for God, and of God's rage. Satan says he doesn't want to deify God's power as if he could as if God needed that. Did God ever doubt his empire? For reading this as Christians, I think it would be appropriate to laugh through our noses at Satan's claims, at his pomposity and self-importance. As Chesterton said, Satan fell by the force of gravity. One more thing before we finish this segment. Satan famously says, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same? He follows this up with the famous lines that epitomize his rebellion. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. This is out of the world of teenagers listening to punk rock or metal music. Why is Milton doing this? Why give Satan such cool and attractive lines? I had a graduate student who stopped reading at this point. He thought the poem was too glorifying of rebellion and might cause him to sin. What is Milton up to? His epic poem allows us to see Satan from a larger perspective of God's plan for mankind. Like we saw in the passage above, there's irony here too. What Milton is doing is similar to what C.S. Lewis does at the end of Out of the Silent Planet, when we see Weston and Divine for what they are, though they think they are the smart ones before the Oryarsa. Satan speaks here brilliantly, and in him we experience the psychology of fallenness. This is how fallen angels and fallen men think. While it's not without its rhetorical glories on one level, it is foolish on another. Satan speaks here brilliantly, and in him we experience the psychology of fallenness. This is how fallen angels and fallen men think. While it's not without its rhetorical glories on one level, it is foolish on another. Martin Luther said the devil is God's devil. Milton depicts Satan in much the same way. Though Satan is given a certain amount of freedom, he's bound by the will of God. Consider this passage from book one. So stretched out huge in length, the arch fiend lay chained on the burning lake nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs. Let me interrupt this passage and ask, why? Why would God leave him at large, leave him free? Here's what follows. That with reiterated crimes, he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others, and enraged might see how all this malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, 
grace and mercy shown on man by him seduced, but on himself trouble, confusion, wrath, and vengeance poured. Satan will see the outcome of his own rebellion, his own damnation. And God will turn this to evil to good. He will bring forth infinite goodness. Milton shows, moreover, that all of Satan's glory, and he does allow him a certain amount of glory, is not original with Satan. It is borrowed glory. He above the rest in shape and gesture, proudly eminent, stood like a tower. His form had not lost all her original brightness. This passage goes on to liken Satan to the sun shorn of his beams due to a morning cloud, or the sun at half its visibility because of an eclipse. But my point is this, Satan is running on borrowed capital. What we see in him then is not of himself. It all comes from his original brightness. And where did that come from? From his unfallen state. He's like the culture that's still blessed by its financial successes, but denies that they came from Christ. Like an ice cube on a hot stove, his decline will be precipitous. In the meantime, Satan imagines himself to be worthy of taking the son of God's role as Messiah. Yes, you heard that correctly. Milton creates a reason for Satan's fall. It's the son's exaltation as Messiah. While this is not exactly in the Bible, Milton is being created with Psalm 2 in Hebrews chapter 1, which Milton puts this way. This day I have begot whom I declare my only son, and on this holy hill him have anointed, whom ye now behold at my right hand. Your head I him appoint. As the son is exalted, so are the angels. But Satan denies this exaltation. He says they are being diminished. All seemed well pleased, all seemed, but were not all. It takes the angel Abdiel to confront Satan and to tell him the son is the one who made him and that the son is worth more than all the angels combined. Satan responds by claiming that he is not a created being, but self-begot, self-raised. His logic is ludicrous. But this is his reason for his rejection of God. So we've seen that God allows Satan to do what he does for a good purpose, and we've seen that Satan's ambition leads him to foolishly claim too much for himself. Another way Milton puts Satan in his place is through parody. Milton agrees with Augustine that evil is a privation of the good. Evil can create nothing, can only invent new ways of misusing the good. Satan's kingdom is merely a bad copy of the son's good kingdom. Satan imagines in the fantasy world in which he lives that his flight to earth for the purpose of extending his own kingdom involves a true sacrifice, but it costs him nothing and he does it for his own glory. Whereas the son says this to his father, behold me then, me for him, that is for fallen man. Life for life I offer, on me let thine anger fall. Account me, man, that I for his sake will leave thy bosom in his, this glory next to thee, freely put off, and for him lastly die, well pleased. On me let death wreck all his rage. This is true sacrifice. The son gives up everything. If that's not enough, Milton demonstrates the superiority of the son in the epic battle in Book 6, the central book of Paradise Lost. The beginning of the battle, Satan, high in the midst, exalted as a god, sits. He is the idol of majesty divine. He's acting as a god, but he's a false god. And his chariot is a counterfeit of gods and in every way inferior. God offers you real moving clouds in a blue sky, sunlight warming your skin. Satan takes a picture of that and puts it on a billboard and says, behold my creation and better than God's. William Blake famously said, the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God and at liberty when he wrote of devils and hell is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. Some romantics interpreted Satan positively. Satan has the energy, but that's to miss where the real creative artistic energy lies. Milton is exceptionally good at describing the goodness of the garden and of unfallen Adam and Eve. I'm not saying we'll agree with everything he says about unfallen creation, but I'm saying Milton's God is good, a gracious maker who gives an abundant creation to Adam and Eve. And one of the sententiae of the poem is this, but to create is greater than created to destroy. How pithy is that? But to create is greater than created to destroy. Do you get it? Who creates? God alone. Who can only twist and destroy? Satan. So as a reader, you might f first find Satan more interesting. He's actually, as C.S. Lewis put it, boringly self-focused. But is Milton's God, is a character as interesting as Satan? Well, if you look at his creative powers and what he produces, yes. If you look at his dialogue in book three, you might find it too theological and unfeeling. So Blake has a point, but a small one. Yes, Milton's Satan comes off as more exciting. Milton gives evil its due, but that excitement is short-lived. Satan ad admits as much, and in a moment of truth admits he's a fraud. O oh, son, to tell thee how I hate thy beams that bring to my remembrance from what state I fell, how glorious once above thy sphere, 
till pride and ambition threw me down, warring in heaven against heaven's matchless king. Ah, wherefore? He deserved no such return from me, whom he created what I was in that bright eminence, and with good upbraided none, nor was his service hard. Here Satan comes clean. He had no reason to rebel. His own pride and ambition drove him to turn against, to use Francis Schaeffer's phrase, the God who is there. In this moment, the emphasis is on the good God who is there. The classical scholar C.M. Bauer helped me to understand what Milton is doing with his character, Satan. He put it this way, when Milton decided to write a heroic epic in the traditional manner with a new purpose, he could hardly have altogether avoided the old type of hero. It is true that he disparaged him, but nonetheless, he must find some kind of place for him. It was part of the tradition and could not be well excluded. It might even be argued that such a hero was necessary as a contrast and as a preliminary to the new type of hero who Milton proclaims. While romantic readers like Blake and Shelley celebrate Satan and make him the hero of Paradise Lost, Bauer gives us another option. Bauer speaks of Satan as the old type of hero. And he says, Satan as hero provides a necessary contrast to the new type of hero, the Christian hero that Adam and Eve are called to be, and that you and I are called to be, as we imitate the true heroism of the Son. Satan is not the hero, he's better thought of as a hero of the poem, the old type, of hero Milton is seeking to replace with a sacrificial Christian heroism. One final thought on Satan's attractive powers in Paradise Lost comes from a celebrated passage on virtue from Milton's prose work, Areopagitica. He that can apprehend and consider vice with all her baits and seeming pleasures and yet abstain and yet distinguish and yet prefer that which is truly better, he is the true warfaring Christian. I cannot, says Milton, praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue, unexercised and unbreathed, that never sallies out to see her adversary, but slinks out of the race. This is Milton's thinking behind his character, Satan. What does this reveal? It reveals that John Milton loves us. Unlike the false teachers and influencers all around us, he's teaching you and me in his epic how to be unpersuaded by Satan's baits, by the world's baits. But to do that, he must dangle them in front of our eyes first. Now you must apprehend their seeming pleasures and abstain and yet distinguish and yet prefer that which is truly better. In the end, Paradise Lost is an education in good and evil. Satan's fantasy in which he is the hero of his own story, as compelling as it is for some readers, is only a part of the larger story. The story in which the son is the true friend of humanity and the father the lavish maker of all that is good.